this is, this morning, the purpose of, of wealth. And I think every time a pastor talks about the purpose of wealth, he always uh, he takes a big, a big swallow. He kind of goes, ooh. And uh, I think because people get offended so easily when you talk about money. They get so offended, they... they but let's, let's be honest. If, if we're talking, if we preach proportionate to what it talks about in the Bible about, about possessions and wealth, uh, then we have to actually preach about it a lot. Because the Bible talks more about wealth than just about any subject. Matter of fact, one guy said 16 of the 38 parables were concerned with how to handle money and possessions. In the Gospels, an amazing, listen to this, one out of ten verses, 288 in all, deal directly with the subject of money. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than, get ready, 2,000 verses on money and possessions. And people yet, when a pastor has a message on giving, it is all of a sudden like, oh, he, all he talks about is money. <laughs> it's like, well, that's all the Bible talks about, so I'm just preaching the Word of God, you know? <laughs> And I really don't talk about it all that much. If we dedicated, if we dedicated the amount of time God gave to the topic of money, if I dedicated that in my service, we would sing. If it was proportional preaching, we'd sing for five minutes, we'd take an offering for 40, and I would declaratively preach the rest. So we're going to do that today. <laughs> Just kidding. This message is not necessarily a message on how much to give. This is talking about the purpose of our wealth, the purpose of our money. People argue about how much to give and where to give it all the time. Let me just tell you right out the bat, a tithe is 10%. That's what a tithe means in the Bible. People say, well, we don't have to give a tithe anymore. Uh, it's not under the New Covenant. Some people say it is under the New Covenant. You know what? People argue all this all the time. And let me just tell you right now, nobody argues when the Bible says that we need to give. Forget the percentage for just a moment. This isn't about a percentage. I think, personally, I think that everybody in this church gives. I don't know of anybody who says to me, Pastor, I don't give, and I don't, I don't know if anybody doesn't give. I, that's the truth. That is the truth. There are people who put cash in the offering plate that I can't reconcile and give a statement at the end of the year, so I don't know if they give. I'm just assuming everybody gives. And that's exciting to me as a pastor. Now, in proportion to income, in proportion to what a person brings in, some people give a little, and some people give a lot. It's just true. In proportion to income, but the moment that we start to make it about a rule, we miss the relationship. I, I think proportional giving is a fine way to start for those who haven't given before. I think that's a fine way to start. But I don't think it should end there. That's my stance on, as a pastor. I, I, do, I, don't, I don't think to myself as this is a rule, I have to give 10% of my income, this is how much my check should be. Now some people may do that, and that's fine, whatever. But I don't want to make giving about a rule. I want to make it about a relationship. And you know, people will give more under a relationship than they will a rule. People will give more under grace than they will under law. And they'll have a better attitude about it. But this message is not about giving per se. So what I want to do is I want to give you two words and two principles. Two words and two principles. First of all, let's talk about the word contentment. The word contentment. Now, you have to remember, this is one of the hardest battles in the Christian life. Contentment. Very, very difficult. This is no new battle. This isn't something that some Christian just drummed up a uh, hundred years ago or fifty years ago. Or This isn't new with the age of advertising. Contentment has been tough since 6,000 years ago. Adam and Eve are in the garden. God says, this is what I've given you. And be content. Now that's in the Hebrew. <laughs> it's not really. Anyway, be content is the goal. Be content with what you have. Did you know that they struggled with contentment? This is not, a, this is not a, a new battle. You do understand that 
The problem is, is that we're not satisfied with what God has given to us. Because if everything that we have has been given to us from God, then when we are discontent, we're not satisfied with what God gave us. Let me give you an illustration. You hold out your hand and God puts a $10 bill in your hand. And we are supposed to be content with this $10 bill. But so oftentimes we put out the other hand and say, Lord, that would be okay, but what if I could get another $10 bill? What if I just had a little more? See, God is saying, be satisfied with the 10 that you got. And when we say, Lord, I'd like another $10 bill, what we're saying is, Lord, I'm not satisfied with what you gave me. Because if this came from God and we want more, then we're not, ca- they're not satisfied with what God gave us. Contentment is a very tough thing to understand, but in, the, in a sense, contentment is you are not satisfied with what God has given to you. Hebrews 13.5 is very clear on the topic of contentment. It's, it's a profound verse. I, you, should, you should memorize this one. Listen to this. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Okay, let your manner of life, let the way you live, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. Be content with the ten dollars here. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, there is never satisfaction in the life of a man who is not content. There's never satisfaction in the life of a man who is not content. He will always want more. Uh, One guy said this, Matthew Henry, he said, He is much happier that is always content, though he has ever so little than he that is always coveting, coveting, though he has ever so much. I would rather have little and be satisfied than have a lot and be discontented because when you have two hands that you're asking God for another ten, you're saying, how do I get another hand out there? Because you're never content with what he has already given you. And, And the fact of the matter is, is that This verse right here, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, should be enough to satisfy our weary souls. We should be satisfied with knowing that we have a God who loves us, saves us, secures us forever, and will never leave us nor forsake us. That should be enough. We should should have enough contentment from that alone to satisfy. Very few people have this figured out. This idea of contentment. And let me tell you a quick story. I don't even know that I have it figured out. Years ago, when I was, uh, when I was a younger, <laughs> a younger preacher, I did a Sunday school. And I did a Sunday school on the topic of contentment. That was, that was the topic. I called it Contentment 101. As if I was teaching the course. And I remember when I got up there, I've, I've used this as an illustration. I, got up, I stood up in front of this class, a couple hundred people, it was a Sunday school, a couple hundred people, and I said, I said, I want you to know something, that I don't have this thing figured out. And I said, this is not for you. This is for me. Very few people have the idea of contentment figured out, and I'm not saying that I have it all figured out either, but there is value in contentment. There's more value in being content than anything else. If you, if you can be satisfied with what God has given you, you're the richest person I know. You're wealthy beyond imagination because you'll never want any more than what you have. One of the greatest verses on contentment is 1 Timothy 6, 6-10. through But godliness with contentment is great gain. It doesn't, it doesn't say anything about money here, does it? The great gain is not in your riches. It's not in what you have. It's not in your possessions. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. You didn't bring anything in, you're not going to leave with anything. Now, we all know that, but oftentimes we don't practice that. We want to store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. That's true, we do that. We want to to take it all, and we we want to protect it all. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You came in with nothing, you're going to leave with nothing. Verse 8, And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. 
you're telling me all I need to do is eat and put clothes on my back and I should be content? Yes. Yes. For they that will be rich, now listen to this, this is great. For they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, that is not a place that I want to be. I would rather be broke and have absolutely nothing and be satisfied with that than to be this guy who falls into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in perdition and, uh, which, in, in destruction and perdition. I, I would rather have nothing than to have temptation and a snare. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It's not a fat checkbook with a big house is great gain. Matter of fact, it says that they that be rich fall into temptation or snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. It's amazing when you get something, how you want something more. We're just dissatisfied. We have a contentment issue. Godliness, not money, is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, that's word one, contentment. Second word, covetousness. Covetousness. Now, um, we never experience freedom through covetousness. Uh, the reality is, is there's only bondage. There's only bondage because you always want what you can't have, and if you never get it, you'll always want it. There's always a sense of bondage. There's no freedom in that. A covetous person will never be satisfied by possessions, even if they do get it. Because they'll always want something more, because that's their character, covetousness. Now Luke 12 gives a, a, a strong warning. Here's what he says. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. I mean, here's a, here's a warning. Beware of this thing. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Here is a warning. Why do you think there's a warning? Because there's danger. There's danger in covetousness. And so he warns them, beware of this thing. A man's life isn't about all the stuff that he has. We need to stay away from coveting. It's harmful. It's harmful. It's so harmful that, uh, that Paul mentions this in the book of Ephesians, and he, and he gives this, uh, this string of, of, uh, of things we need to stay away from. And here's what he says, listen to this. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Following fornication is covetousness. Now that's pretty profound. We need to stay away from it. This is not something to be taken lightly. People always want to covet and they think it's all okay and they, they just assume that, well, you want more and that's a fine thing. Here's why I think it's so dangerous. Here's why I think it's so dangerous. Because money is in control of him who's not in control of his money. If a person is not in control of their money, the money controls them. Very dangerous to be controlled by money because we're supposed to be spirit-controlled, not money-controlled. One guy said this. He said, if money be not thy master, or I'm sorry, if money be not thy servant, it will be thy master. So if it's not your servant, it's your master. The covetous man cannot so properly be said to possess wealth as that may be said to possess him. How often times is it that what we have actually becomes our master as opposed to our servant? Beware of covetousness because it will control you. Money makes a great servant but a terrible master. The money should serve you and you shouldn't serve it. We need to be aware of this topic of covetousness. We need to have contentment and not have covetousness. All right, now let's look quickly at two principles. Two principles. First of all, God provides our needs. When we talk about the purpose of money, we talk about God providing our needs. Now listen to this. Matthew 6 is one of the most complete passages on this topic. 
Here it goes. I'm going to read a few verses for you. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Is life not more than what you wear and what you eat? Listen to this. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? You know, it's interesting, he brings up the fowls of the air. Look what he says about them. They, they, they sow, neither do they reap. They don't gather into barns. So they don't plant, they don't harvest, and then they don't store up things that they've harvested. But God takes care of them. And then he says, are ye not much better than they? Are, are you not better than the fowls and the birds of the air? God takes care of the birds and they don't do anything. <laughs> They're just lazy. And God takes care of them. Aren't you better than they? So you don't think God will take care of you. So you're out there and you're, 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 you're harvesting, or, or rather, rather you're cultivating. I know the process of planting, by the way. <laughs> you, you cultivate, right? You cultivate the soil. You sow the seed. You plant that in the ground. And you give it some water, right? And in this case, we give it a lot of herbicides, insecticides, pesticides, and formaldehydes. <laughs> Maybe it's not formaldehydes. But anyway, we give it a lot of stuff. And we get these... We get, this, we get this big harvest, this, this, this big crop, then we harvest it out, then we take that harvest, we store it up in barns, right? We do all this work. We don't think God will take care of us, though the birds don't do any work, and God takes care of them. We're better than the birds. Boy, I thank God for that. Verse 28, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows that you have need of all these things. Verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God provides our need regardless if we have money or not. So then what is the purpose of money? The purpose of money is so that God can provide our needs. And he does that through our wealth. Some people say, well, I'm not wealthy. Well, you might not be wealthy in, 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 in some manner that you think you're wealthy, but you have a lot more than, than other people. And that's just true. Some people say, well, I don't have, I, I'm not a millionaire. It's funny how a millionaire is... Um, it, it, that, that's a wealthy person for some reason. Why, why is that? You know, there are 50,000 millionaires in Iowa. There are 249,000 uh, millionaires. 249,000 millionaires in Illinois. Let me tell you what. A million dollars is not that much money. Actually, it is. <laughs> I'm just, I can't lie. I can't say that with a straight face. Face. That's just true. A million dollars is a lot of money. But, you know what? A million dollars has no real value in terms of godliness because godliness with contentment is great gain. And you could have one dollar, have godliness and contentment, and have as much or more than the person who has a million dollars. God can take care of the fowl of the air. God can take care of the lilies of the field. Don't you think that he can take care of us? Sure he can. He can take care of us with or without money. He chooses to use money. Isn't that interesting? That God chooses to use money to take care of us. Now let me say this too, because God never promised to provide all of our wants. I think this is a real big misnomer. We all have a lot of things. 
God never promised to provide everything that we want. He says that he'll provide all of our needs. And he says that Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's going to provide all of our needs. Having said that, he does provide a lot of our wants as well. How many of you, this is rhetorical, so you don't have to answer this, how many of you have things that are beyond your need? We all have things that we actually want. When people say, but, but my needs aren't being met. No, 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 your needs are being met. And actually, you have beyond that. You have beyond that. You have things that you even want. And God never promised to give you that. God promised to supply just our needs. Now let me say this. I want to say this very carefully. Because I don't want to offend anybody. Our wealth is not so that we can pamper ourselves. God, he, take, he uses money, which by the way is his, and if we have a right perspective on that, we'll understand that God takes money that's his, he allows us to use it, but that money is not so we can pamper ourselves. Now, I'm, I'm not against nice things. I like nice things. I really do like nice things. But the money that we have is not so that we can have a, a bigger and better it's not so that we can have all of the luxury in all the world. It's not so that we can buy a, a hundred foot yacht. If you have a hundred foot yacht, I'd like to go on it. <laughs> Just so you know. I've never been on a hundred foot yacht, but that would be totally legit. And then we'll talk about what to do with that yacht. We could start a missionary or fund or something. I don't know. It's not to pamper ourselves. We're supposed to use what God has given to us to provide the needs that we have. Provide for those needs. He, he's, he's given us these things. And this is really, really important. Uh, we need to be a good steward of what he has given to us. Okay. Now, being a good steward is not saying, well, I got the best deal on pampering myself. It's not, it's not being a good steward because you're really pampering yourself, which isn't necessarily the purpose of the money. The purpose of the money is to provide for your need. And he does that, God does that through, through money. Through money. That's backed by the United States government. It means nothing right now. <laughs> You're pretty much your money isn't worth what you think it is, so don't ever worry about it. Uh, you got to love inflation. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. God provides our needs. Now listen to this. this is, that was the first principle. Second principle. Okay, two words, contentment and covetousness, two principles. God provides our needs. Next, God provides the needs of others through us. Okay? God provides the needs of others through us. There's not enough Christians in the world that understand this. This is how God provides other people's needs. He provides it through you. Isn't that interesting? that you can be a blessing to somebody else because of what God has given you. It's not to pamper yourself. It's not to, it's not to, to have all of the world's riches and, and everything. It's to say there are people out there who have a need, and I can help with that need. Listen to this verse, uh, great verse, 1 Timothy uh, 6.17. Charge them that are rich in this world. Charge them that are rich in this world. That they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now Paul here tells Timothy several things about those people who are essentially rich in this world, who have money. He goes on to verse 18, by the way, and he says this, uh, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Tell the rich people, according to this world, a few things. Let's talk about it. First of all, uh, Paul is clear on the audience. It's the people in this world who have riches according to this world. This is not talking about people who store up their riches in heaven. This is talking about the people who have piles of cash. Like me, I have piles of cash. <laughs> it's fiction, they're fake. It's uh, Monopoly money, but I still have piles of cash. And uh, we're talking about real cash, though. We're talking about money. People who are rich according to this world, who have a lot of possessions. 
Secondly, he's telling them here, he's telling them not to be high minded. Don't be arrogant. Now, first of all, remember that God gave this to you, and as quick as he gives it to you, he can take it back that fast. Don't think that what you have really belongs to you. It really belongs to God. That's who this belongs to. Tell them not to be arrogant. There are so many people in this world who have money who are arrogant about their money. Don't be high-minded. If you have piles of cash at home, fine. Don't be arrogant about it. There, there are some people who are just not arrogant about their money. I'm going to give you an example of a, someone that, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the folks, but Dana and I, when we first got married, we were house-sitting for someone. Oh, so what was their name? The Arns. Right? A 13,000 square foot house. Now, I can't even begin to tell you how big that is. We were house sitting. We were invited over, and, uh, and it was a, Dana would, um, was uh, taught their kid in preschool. And so they give us the address, and we're driving over, you know, clunkety clunk. <laughs> Somewhat embarrassing. Clunkety clunk. She says, make a right here, make a left here. I'm just trusting my wife. We got, came up to this house, and I said, baby, you're wrong. <laughs> Ain't no way we're staying in this thing. And I looked at the door, and, and uh, doing some construction, I said, that's got to be a $20,000 door. Baby, you are wrong. He said, you, this is wrong house. She says, no, this is the address. And I said, well, that's the address, but this ain't the house. We finally, you, timidly, by the way, because you, you, don't, you don't act like an idiot. You know your wife is wrong. So <laughs> you go up and you knock on the door. Actually, it was more like clunk, 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 clunk. And I stood over here like this. And door opens, she says, Dana! And I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> so we go into this, into this person's house and uh, just embraces Dana and says, well, you must be the new Mr. Huss. I said, I didn't know there was an old one. Anyway, I said, <laughs> I said well, yeah, I am. Nice to meet you. And, and we're just kids at the time. I mean, this was 15 years ago, so we're, we're just young. And, and uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. We, we go in and she says, oh, come into the kitchen. Come into the kitchen. And you're looking at this, this kitchen. Hooah! I mean, it was a kitchen. They had a, I mean, it was as big as this room. No kidding. And, uh, and they brought us in there. They sat us down. They said, we just want to make this a blah, 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 blah. Well, we got talking, this, this lady and I, and we were just chatting. And uh, I said, well, where, where's, where's, where's the mister? You know, and oh, oh, he's, he's, he's in the back. He's studying for some twin engine thing and I'm like oh he's a pilot I said my dad's a pilot <gasps> oh let me go get him so she rushes grabs him out comes out and and he says well hi I'm Chris I heard your dad's a pilot and I said well he is I heard you're studying for a twin he says yeah 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 tell me about your dad's plane I said well it's this and this and I said well tell me about your plane he says now is that a single that's a single prop right I said well that one is yeah and he says well well tell me how long has he had his pilot's license I'm like well he's had it for a while how long have you had yours well let me ask you this about your dad he didn't talk about himself. I was blown away. I don't even remember. I, I think his name was Chris. Yeah, see, there you go. I remembered one thing about the guy, his name. He didn't tell me anything about himself other than his name. This guy, he, he says, oh, well, listen, i got to get back to this crazy, crazy thing. I, he says, enjoy yourself. Pretend like you're on a vacation. He says, I'm out of here. And he goes back to his office, and I'm just, my jaw is like, this guy didn't say anything. Well, she showed us down to the lake, and she said, you know, take, feel free to take the boat out. <laughs> it was just a canoe. <laughs> anyway, so feel free to take the canoe out and go across, paddle across. It was a private lake with no motor, anyways, engines. Anyway, so there we were, and uh, we come back inside, and she says, basically, that's the upstairs, there's the downstairs, and uh, feel free just to eat whatever you want in the fridge. And, and, and just feel free to look around, just whatever. You, you know what? It was humbling because I know of people who have a whole lot less money who say, oh, let me show you in here, the beautiful bathroom. We just had this done. It was 30 grand. And I'm thinking, this guy's an idiot. You know, <laughs> 30 grand in bathroom. Anyway, so we're, he shows us around, or, or she, they didn't show us around. They said, feel free to look around. We, uh, one of the things we had to do, we had to do this. I remember this. This is so much fun. Uh, so, now, now you got me curious. 13,000 square foot house. That is, I mean, I felt like a, I don't know, treasure hunt. You know, <laughs> I'm going to look around this place. So we went into the master bedroom. And I remember coming into this thing and 
you know, open this door. Looking around. So I go to get my tape measure. <laughs> so I got my tape measure out, and I 25-foot tape measure, lay it across and put a mark with my shoe, take my shoe off and, you know, pull the tape measure back and put my other shoe down there and pull it back a little further. And I said, put my watch down there and pull it back. And that's a 1,200 square foot master bedroom. It was huge. I was bigger than my house and my garage and my yard all put together. And I was just, I was so stunned that they didn't show us that. I was taken back at the fact that they didn't care about how much money they had. There are some people so stuck on themselves and so arrogant that everything is a prize. So Paul is telling them that they ought not to be high-minded. Make sure that those that are rich in this world aren't proud about their riches. It's interesting Paul calls them uncertain riches. Do you know why he calls them uncertain? Because they're uncertain. They provide no value. They don't really have any lasting anything. It's just money. It's just money. Proverbs says, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. The money goes, bye bye How many of you have seen that? About tax time. Bye-bye. There's no, they're all uncertain. You're going to spend your money, number one, or you're going to leave it to somebody who will squander it. That's the truth. You might as well use it to glorify God. You might as well use it for God's purposes. Fifth, fourthly, rather, fourthly, that they do good. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. This is the plan. This is the plan. God uses money to help you. He provides your needs through money. This is the purpose of money. Ready for this? He, he provides your needs, but he also provides for the needs of others. Money is not about pampering yourself. It's about, it's about giving, giving money to people who need it. It's about providing for the needs of others. And that's when he gets to the fifth thing, is that they be rich, or that, the, that, these, that these rich people give according to, to the needs of people, that they be ready to distribute. That's what the word, uh, the word communicate means generous. So that, they're, that they give and that they are generous with their money. And friends, I am telling you, there are a lot of people who are not generous with their money. They're not liberal. They're conservative with their money. And they want to keep a pile of cash for themselves. Again, I'm not, I'm not afraid of saying this. You, you, you need a savings account. And you need to have a, a reserve fund. That's fine. But there gets to be a certain point that your money is all it's about is just pampering yourselves. I don't mind people having a boat. I don't mind people having an ATV. I, I, I don't. I just borrow Max's. <laughs> Thank you for having a boat, by the way. He's providing for a need for me to ki- have my kids out on a boat. But you see, there is a purpose for our wealth. The purpose for our wealth is to provide for us so that we can provide for others. Isn't that marvelous? God gives us money. It's all his. All that we have is thine. Not ours. We're just supposed to be stewards of it. You know, the best thing, the best thing of all, the best thing of all, the, the most precious thing of all that we have, the most, the most valuable thing that we have is our salvation. You know that? The most valuable thing we have is, a, is our relationship with God. If it wasn't for that, I mean, would there really be a need to live? I mean, honestly, if you didn't have a relationship with God, I tell you what, the, that, that, is, that is the thing that I value the most over everything. I, I can lose everything. Everything. Give everything away. And you know what? As long as I have a right relationship with God, I have, I have everything I need. I pray the Lord doesn't try me on that. But the truth is, is that should be all of our heart's desire. Is that everything we have, everything that we need, is just our Lord. Friends, if you are here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you 
were to die today, are you sure you'd know where you were going to go? There's a lot of people that say, well, I, I think so. There's a lot of people who store up all the treasures. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What's, if you have all the money in the world, but you die and go to hell, is that really of any value to you? All the money in the world doesn't mean anything if you spend an eternity separated from God. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, I want, I want to show you this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. And I want my wallet to represent all of our sin. Here we are with our sin. The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that, that here we are, every one of us is a sinner. Some churches say, they say, turn over a new leaf. Problem is, is you still have your sin right here. Uh, there are some people, some churches that say, as long as you get baptized, you walk an aisle, you pray a prayer, you do all of these things. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, not walking an aisle. The wages of sin is death. It's not church membership. It's not giving money to the church. You can't buy your way to heaven, by the way. This isn't, I'm not trying to, not trying to encourage people to give so they earn their salvation. Forget about it. It can't be done. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not turning from sin, not walking an aisle, joining a church, giving money, coming forward, nothing. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross. See that? The wages of sin was death. Someone had to pay for it. Either you pay for it and spend an eternity separated from God, or you trust by faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. It's not of works. It's not of giving money. It's not of walking an aisle. It's not of praying a prayer. It's not because you're good. It's of faith. When you trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again the third day, and you believe that by faith, you have eternal life. There's nothing more valuable than that. In Sunday school, we talked about uh, Colossians 3. Set your affections on things above, not on things below. Set your affections on things above where Christ sitteth in the right hand of God. Our affection should be on that. Our, 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 all, of, all of our value should be placed in the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. We have eternal life with Him. There's nothing greater than that. There's nothing more valuable than than that relationship. Not to your spouse, not to your kids, not to your parents. The best relationship that you can ever have is a relationship with Christ. You know that He died for you. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know that, if you don't know where you're going when you die, simply by placing your faith in Him alone as your Savior, gets you to heaven. It's when you trust in His good works to get you to heaven. His good works were the death on the cross, being buried and coming back from the grave. It's amazing. Why would we store up treasures on earth when we can put all our treasures towards a heavenly goal? I'm not, I'm not going to take a fundraiser after this. It's not what this is about. I'm not going to have a, have a giving Sunday. This is the purpose of our wealth. Use it to glorify God because you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You came into this world with nothing, you're going to leave with it. You're going to leave with nothing. And if you are here today, you don't know Christ as your Savior, place your faith in Him alone. Would you do that? Would you do that?